Good morning, Crossway Church. It's wonderful to see you all gathered. Uh, you might want to get your Bible ready. We'll turn to a few different passages. Um, hello to those watching online. We love you. Hope you are well. And uh, let me give you a quick update on our building fund giving goals. Thank you again for uh, your generosity, your sacrifice, your faith in the Lord, and your commitment to one another to link arms and to put your shoulder together to the same burden. Uh, this year's giving goals uh, total $138,000 from 68 households, and the total given so far is just over $27,000, which is about 20% of the goal already. So we're well on our way. Thank you for the way you give. I remember when I was in my mid-teens arguing with my father. It doesn't really matter what I was arguing about. There was always something to argue about. Have you ever argued with your parents? Are you arguing now with your parents? Are you teens and arguing now with your parents? I remember one time in particular, I was arguing to get my way, my poor father, and his reply at that point basically stopped me. And he stopped the argument from going much further. He said something like, we, meaning my mother and him, we're trying to do the best we can as parents before the Lord, and we believe that this is how we ought to honor the Lord. In other words, the decision that he had given me that I was arguing against, he was saying he believed that this was in a good conscience what God would call him to stand on and to give to his son as a decision. And when he appealed like that to the authority over him, that changed things for me. I didn't like it, and I believe I argued uh, just a bit longer, not much longer, but the force was really taken out of my words because now I'm not simply arguing with my dad, I'm arguing with God. And shortly after he said that, the discussion was over and I submitted to his decision. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that that uh, phrase that we're doing the best we can before the Lord. I'm not saying that phrase is a silver bullet tactic of parenting. Please don't take it like that or think of it that way. You see, what made that moment effective for us and our family was the fact that my father did, in reality, submit to and fear the Lord. And I knew that he submitted to and feared the Lord. That was obvious to me, and it was that combination of spoken truth, sincerely uh, deployed, with the faithful example of his life that I knew that helped me and trained me. And that is why I could not take my complaining, burdensome argument with him any further. My proposal for us this morning is not too different from that lesson that my father taught me but instead of teens with parents, that this has to do with all of us believers here at Crossway Church. It has to do with us, and it has to do with our government and how we relate to our government. For, so for our purposes, let's say it like this. Surrender to the Lord so that you know how to resist. Surrender to His authority so that when it comes to dealing with our earthly authority, we know how we should resist. We've been in a series entitled Church and State, and this is our last message in the series. Next week, we're going into Second Peter. So this is our last message, and last week, we talked about when we're called to resist. Today, we're going to focus more on how to resist. Let me add a qualification here. Uh, we're not, at, we're talking, you know, last week, we talked about when to resist. This week we're going to talk about how to resist. So let me add this qualification. We're not anticipating, we're certainly not planning on any immediate need to resist the government. So please don't think of it that way. Thankfully, we don't seem to be in that place right now at this exact moment, even though there does seem to be at least some negative sentiment against Christianity in our culture in these days. Recently, we were contemplating an article and a, a teaching from a man who talked about how 
Christians used to have a very, there was a very positive view of Christianity and Christians and church life and, and culture was connected to that in the United States of America. And this was, wasn't that long ago. Most of us have experienced that sort of positive approach societally. Somewhere there in the 90s or so, it became a, a, a neutral thing. It was like, okay, you go to church or you don't go to church. Now, some of the laws that are coming are direct, directly contradictory to, to Christian teaching. And so you could say that there's a sense of a negative attitude toward Christianity in our culture, at least some sentiment, some negative sentiment against Christianity in our culture. But nevertheless, we're not planning on resisting. We don't have any plans to do so. But this teaching is about equipping the church and preparing us. Many of these principles have come to us through history, through the time of the Reformation and even before. As the church has sought out God's Word, they looked at God's Word, and how therefore to relate to, uh, to a government that is opposing God's Word and opposing God's people. And understand when and how we ought to do so. So, no immediate need to resist the government. Nevertheless, we have just been through as a church the government's response to COVID-19, the culture's response to COVID-19, and because of the generally anti-Christian sentiment in our culture, we should be equipped. And what we said last week was that we may need to resist when the kingdoms of this world attempt to impose themselves on the kingdom of God, the kingdom of our Lord. When the kingdoms clash in our lives, the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of our earthly citizenship, and the kingdom of our higher heavenly citizenship, our ultimate and eternal citizenship with Christ, when those kingdoms clash in our lives in such a way that the government is calling us to rebel against God in order to submit to it, when that happens, we should understand how to respond. And so we need to begin by surrendering to the Lord, and that will guide us and help us to understand how to resist. So when it's time to resist, how do we resist? What do we do? Well, first of all, we take a high view of the government. We take high view, a high view of government, the concept of government, not meaning necessarily everything that the government is doing or every one that is in the government, but the concept of government, the fact that we have a government, we take a high view. And we have talked about this through the series, but we need to hit on it again because when it comes to how we resist, we've really got to start with this point. There are certainly too many people in our society that believe that the government is the answer for everything. Every problem that society has, they think that the government has an answer for that. And now, if that were even close to true, by now we should have achieved utopia. And of course, no one has achieved utopia. And everyone that tries to achieve utopia or nirvana finds it completely lacking. And the opposite of that, and the reason that it's impossible to achieve on this earth is because humanity is in a fallen state. Many people don't think of themselves as as seeking utopia. And yet that's exactly what they're doing because they look to the government for every answer to fix everything. And that's a losing proposition. Believing that government can bring about heaven on earth is highly problematic, leads to all kinds of destructive distortion in the way people interpret life. But at the same time, believing government is fundamentally a necessary evil, and this might be more relevant for us, believing that the government is just simply or fundamentally a necessary evil, that's problematic too. Like the only reason we have government is because, we, you know, it's fallen, you know, the world's fallen, and so it's really an evil, but it's necessary, and so we put up with it. That's problematic too, and this is where Christians probably depart from the political and social ideology known as libertarianism. And that, of course, depends on how you define it. I think there's probably a legitimate libertarianism, but uh, in certain ways it's defined. It's not really Christian. And so remember this. From Romans chapter 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. 
For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And let's consider this helpful illustration. Remember when King Saul, Israel's first king, believed that David, who was later to become king, he believed that David was insubordinate. He believed that David was going to try to overthrow him and usurp the throne. And nothing could have been further from the truth. There was no one more loyal than David. But Saul was so convinced that David was insubordinate that he wanted to kill David. And so David ran and hid himself in the wilderness, and others joined him to support him out there in the wilderness. But seeing David into exile wasn't enough for Saul. He wanted him dead. He wanted to eliminate the threat. And so he pursued David. And as Saul and his band are making their search, Saul goes into a wilderness cave uh, to use the facilities, shall we say it that way. What he doesn't know is that David and his men are hidden in there. And and when they see Saul and his... um, vulnerable position, his men begin to excitedly tell David, this is your moment. Circumstances could not be clearer. God has given you this moment so that you could kill your enemy and take the throne. So David sneaks up, cuts off a corner of Saul's robe, but then even though he has been falsely accused by this man, even though this man seeks his life, even though this man has ruined his life, And he's being hunted down by the government authority. This is what happens in 1 Samuel 24. Afterward, after he cuts off the corner of his robe, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid, they're probably whispering by the way, right? The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So in other words, David said, I I can't take, I can't exact revenge on my own terms because God put Saul in this position. He made him king over me. And even though he's evil, he's king over me. You see, Christians see government and authority as a fundamental good appointed by God. And that needs to be a starting point for us. One of the odd things today is that on some critical political issues, Christians line up. We're we're finding strange, I hate to use the expression, but you know what I mean, strange bedfellows. Christians line up somewhat strongly with unbelievers like Joe Rogan and Bill Mayer and Elon Musk. These libertarians are strong on the issue of free speech, and that's good and well. I believe you can make a strong biblical case for free speech. But be careful before you lionize these people and start following their thinking. For instance, not long ago, Joe Rogan said that he can't become a Republican, not that we're that interested in Republicanism. We're interested in Christianity and biblical principle. But he said he can't become a Republican because they generally oppose homosexual marriage. He said something like, just let people do whatever makes them happy. That's his his fundamental principle. Just Just let people do whatever makes them happy. And that's incredibly problematic, isn't it? It's not true. That's 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 a bogus assertion. You can't build life, let alone society on the idea of just let people do whatever makes them happy. To affirm that two men or two women can be married is to embrace a let's pretend existence. Let's make pretend that these people are actually married. What is marriage? Marriage is a covenant before God, and God does not acknowledge a a marriage between two men and two women. It's, It's bogus. It's It's baloney. You have to lie to affirm that. Going along with a lie is not loving at all because love begins with truth. It has to be grounded in truth. And further, we Christians have been warning society that if you untether marriage, 
from one man and one woman, which is built into the DNA of human existence by our Creator, by God. If you untether marriage from one man and one woman because of the fundamental realities that that marriage represents, if you untether it from that truth, you lose any ground to bring any definition at all to the concept of marriage, but not only to marriage, to many other fundamental issues. Having our legal system and culture embrace gay marriage in 2015 is why we are seeing right out in the open, drag queen story hour now in 2022. It is not a coincidence. Let's pretend world is getting bolder. More people want to walk in delusion. You know what makes delusion possible? When everyone else around is sane. When everyone else is playing by the rules of reality, then you can deal with the delusional uh, you know, the delusional eccentric one here or there, because they're still operating within the rules of reality. But what happens when everyone is delusional and when no one is grounded in reality? Well, that will implode on itself. And the atrocities to come because of such a concept is is a devastating, the harm that will be done, the hurt, the wronging of people. The descent into oblivion is a slippery slope, and our society is still at the top of the hill. There is a long way down to go. Now, libertarians and others that diminish the value of government, like Joe Rogan, do not understand that society is where it's at in part because of their low view of government all along and their failure to tie government to the very fiber and nature of human existence, which of course inevitably points back to the God who made it. God has given, uh, excuse me, government has a God-given role and it should understand. Government should be self-aware and you see that in the, in the documentation that uh, orients the United States of America, which I'm not here to, to make big proclamations about our founding right now. Those are very interesting conversations. But my point is simply to say it's there. You can't deny it. It's there. Even Thomas Paine, when, when he wrote, he, he's a, this, this uh, 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 infamous deist, and yet he's quoting the Scriptures continually because everyone recognized the Scriptures as a source of truth. Government should be self-aware that it has a God-given role to fulfill. And we've established in this series that government exists to bring about the good that sets the stage for human flourishing. It's what we need to thrive. We, we need the government to bring about the good from its role, from its God-ordained role. For instance, the rule of law is good and enables us to thrive. No one is supposed to be above the law, right? Theoretically, conceptually. And through the law, government brings about something we call social order. And that is also good. It's the order around us that enables us to be secure and to produce and to enjoy and to innovate. It's order that enables all of that. These are the kinds of good that government is meant to facilitate. Unbelievers have often acknowledged this truth. It's not new. For instance, the philosopher Plato records some of the history around the execution of Socrates. You may be familiar with that story that Socrates, this great Greek philosopher, uh, actually ended up being executed essentially. And in his record, Socrates has an imaginary, in Plato's record, Socrates has an imaginary conversation with the laws of Athens. So he's having a conversation with the laws of Athens. And the laws of of Athens are telling Socrates that in being part of this society that Socrates has covenanted with the laws, or he's agreed with the laws to follow the laws for the good of the society. And because he's covenanted with the laws and because 
Uh, society had the laws. The laws produced for society many good things. And therefore, anyone who subverted the law, the, the order that law brought and the social good that the law brought, therefore undermines, if they subvert that, they undermine society and they become an enemy of human prospering. And this is part of why Socrates, even though he had a way out, his friends found a way of escape for him, even though he had that, he didn't follow it because he sought uh, to, to embrace the punishment of the laws, the principle of the laws. Now, if unbelievers and even pagans can see the good that government brings about, how much more should we as Christians see the good and necessary role of government? Even now, consider the societal order that we enjoy because of government. Every one of us made it here to church this morning, and we're gathered in this way, sitting under the Word of God, and in part this is because of the rule of law and the social order that our government provides for us. Think of a few key ways you can appreciate and value the government. One that comes to mind is to be respectful of law enforcement and to teach our children the same, to be respectful and to be responsive to law enforcement, acknowledging the authority behind their position. Another is to acknowledge that government has a rightful authority over us in things like taxes, in things, uh, in, in other, in things like code that we might not like around our neighborhoods, and yet they've got the rightful authority there. Another is to vote. There's an opportunity to engage, to exercise the, the authority that we exercise as citizens in the plurality with which we have it. We have authority in plurality as people of the United States of America. And we could go on. But think of the ways that we can be responsive and appreciate and value the government. I confessed to you last week that I hadn't gotten my car inspected. Well, I got the new car, and I'm getting my car inspected, all right? So I just want to, by the way, thank you very much. I didn't receive any co uh, 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 condemnation from anyone. No one came to me and said, I can't believe you're not following the law. But um, what's that? Uh, I can't hear anymore, so I'll let it go. But, uh, but yeah, so um, uh, we'll see. I might not keep the new car. We'll see. But, uh, but in the meantime, my daughter's going to have the other car. So I'm getting it inspected, although, you know, Getting in over there at J&C Auto is a challenge to do sometimes. So that's on Friday. Boy, I appreciate the Melliners. Consider this before we move on to our next point. Consider how Jesus submitted to the government. He didn't have to. He is the government, right? He holds authority over the government. We, we said it about ourselves. We're Americans. Our government is of and by and for the people, right? But think about Jesus. He literally is the source of any authority on earth. And yet he submits to a corrupt and evil government, ultimately because he's submitting to God. And he submits to the temple guard when they arrest him. He submits to the high priest. It's, it's, it's kind of a joke. There's the high priest talking to the one that the high priest mediates, supposed to be mediating for, the high priest sitting in judgment on him. He submits to the Roman soldiers and the Roman rulers. That is a powerful example. Surrender to the Lord so that you know how to resist. And when it's time to resist, we begin by taking a high view of the government. We don't throw it off or cast it aside. No, we're respectful of that concept. We take a high view of government, but we also examine ourselves closely. Our duty to God is higher than our duty to any other authority. Authority. 
But these duties are not made up of feelings. These duties are not made up of feelings or preferences. And this is a critical point. Think about this. It's, it's, this is something for all of life. When it comes to truth that we're grappling with, and, and we ourselves personally are bumping up against that truth, well, especially when, when emotions are inflamed, when offenses are taken, and this happens between us and the government too, right? So feelings can be so strong and yet they can be so wrong as well, right? Often when an upsetting event occurs, we can react by acting out of our feelings. And it feels so right in the moment. We can feel so justified. Uh, not long ago I saw, and I don't even remember the man's name or all the circumstances around it, but there was a football player NFL player walking off the field. He's walking off the field. He's upset because of how things are going on the field. He's walking off the field. I believe it was a cameraman, somebody uh, completely oblivious to uh, this, uh, this player walking off the field, uh, walks in front of the player uh, and, and just, it, it's just a, a bad time. And the player just shoves him right out of the way, just shoves him. And you look, it's like, oh man, that's really mean. And, uh, and then later he was asked about it, and I, I, I believe he barely, it wasn't really an apology. I think the player said something like, you know, he was there and it happened. Like, almost like he had nothing to do with it, you know, but yet he shoved this man out of his way rather than having any consideration for him. He felt very right when he did that. He felt justified, but it was clearly very wrong. And you just watch the video, it's like, wow, that was aggressive. That poor person didn't deserve that. But we can do that when we're offended with one another. Uh, we can do that in response to the government. Our feelings can, it, we, we can, we can have such strong feelings and yet be so wrong. And not just our feelings, but our preferences. Our preferences can drive us. And this is that idea that, that the, the well of a person's heart is very deep, and, and, and only God is really able to see exactly what's in our heart. And so sometimes we, we have to be aware, this is that idea of being skeptical of our own heart, we have to be aware that whatever issue's coming up, we, we have a certain way that we think it should go, that we want it to go, that we prefer that it would go. And we got to be really careful that whatever it is that we think should happen, when it comes to resisting the government, is it really based on truth or is it, is it based on something less than that, some, some preference that we have? Because those preferences can be really strong and they can, they can motivate and they can drive. And it's up to us to pull ourselves back, to restrain and to say, wait a minute, what's driving me right now? Is it my preference, my ideal of how things ought to look? Or is there something deeper? Is there something ultimately true upon which my resistance is based upon? We must remember that if we're going to challenge God's appointed authority, it should be on grounds that God himself would approve. Right? If we're going to push back, if we're going to resist, then we better be pretty certain that God would approve of that plan, that God himself would say, yeah, what they're doing is wrong. Otherwise, you don't want to do it, and you don't want to make that up. You want to be sure that when you see God, he's going to affirm why you disobeyed, why you resisted. So two ways to help us examine ourselves First, I'm going to combine them, Scripture and prayer. Scripture and prayer. 
That's where we begin and end for believers. As we start with the Word of God, we end with the Word of God. And we engage it prayerfully. So the first table of the commandments, meaning those first few commands from God that have to do with God's people relating to Him. It's that idea of having no other God before Him and no idols or images, not taking His name in vain and remembering the Sabbath day. And we look to the Lord's day in the new covenant. But the whole idea is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And don't live like and don't actually love anything more than God. And so if the government is compelling you to love something other than God, you resist it. This is true of the second table of the Ten Commandments. Things like honoring parents and murder, adultery, immorality, stealing, or bearing false testimony. If the government is compelling you to do these things, And by the way, they don't generally ask you to directly to do these things, right? It would be through the agency of something else, through some policy that you'd be required to be immoral or to commit murder or to steal from others or to bear false testimony. Well, in those cases, we resist that as well because we're called to honor God first. There are New Testament directives like we've talked about with Uh, meeting together with COVID restrictions, that we were not going to neglect meeting together as Hebrews 10, 25 teaches us and directs us. Things like coming to the Lord's table, that when we come together, we should often come to the Lord's table. We're not going to let the government stand between us and the Lord's table and many other issues, but they require us to think things through biblically. So for instance, the vaccine, and obviously this is just a a brief mention here, but for instance, if the government offers the vaccine, if the government takes steps to develop and then offers the vaccine, that's fine and good. The government should offer the vaccine, and maybe there's really good cases for people to take the vaccine. But if the government compels the vaccine, if the government requires people to take the vaccine, and punishes those who don't take the vaccine. So there's a compulsion there. And then, by the way, the way you know that is you ask, well, what happens if I don't do it? What happens? I, do I lose my job? Do I lose my reputation? Do I get fined and penalized in some way? What happens to me if I refuse? The government has authority, but they shouldn't be using it on that. And if in the vaccine, you don't see vaccines in Scripture, but we can take the Scriptures and they can help us understand how to think about being compelled to take the vaccine. And what do we do? Well, we look, what does the Scripture teach us about the image of God? Now, how does that relate to an experimental uh, medication? Let's put it that way. How does it relate to a mass social compulsion, massive pressure to partake of the vaccine, taking into our bodies a medication. So we look at that image of God. We look at the concept of human dignity. We look how the sick were handled in the Scriptures. The same thing is true when it comes to perpetual masking, functional perpetual masking with all the pressure from the government and the media to mask and to distance. How do we weigh that out? Well, we look, the Scriptures don't talk about masks, but they do talk about what it is to be a human. They do talk about a face, what it is to have a face. They do talk about principles of interacting with the sick, of quarantining the sick and not the healthy. The Scriptures do give us the idea of separating people into clean and unclean, and thinking that through and applying it to life. So there are principles that we take from Scripture that help us to think through. And this is generally how it's going to go because the government, as we've talked about before, the government's generally not going to come out the gate and say, if you, don't stop, you know, if you don't deny Christ right now, you're going to jail. Generally, they don't do that. But there's going to be other means. Another way, we talk about prayer, Scripture and prayer 
But another way that, that can help us understand if we're examining ourselves well, if we're taking the proper care before we resist, is fellowship. And I'll simply offer here that iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. And so we, we take to, into account our need to interact, our, our need to, to have more than just the one point of thought. But we come together with our believers, our brothers and sisters, and we take the Scriptures and we take teaching and we say, okay, does this apply properly here? And so your pastors here, we've sought to apply the Scripture to our current circumstances and it seems like our Lord has helped us with that and helped us apply it well. And that's what we must do. We have to continue to do that in all of our interaction with the government and society. And before we move on, we do have to consider our Lord Jesus. We follow our Master, right? If, if our Lord was, you know, he, if He faced the persecution of the government, if He faced persecution, if He suffered, well, then we're going to suffer as well, right? And so this is not exactly self examination like I'm talking about here, but it is a self-emptying moment. Remember when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and he's suffering because he knows what's coming, that the Father has called him to give himself for, for his people, to die. And, and to get there, he's going to, be a, uh, he's going to he's going to face all kinds of false testimony. And ultimately, he's going to be charged with blasphemy in a court of not peers, but of inferiors. We're going to make this stuff up. And so he's there in the garden, and his suffering has already begun because he knows what's coming. But he prays, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. So that's, that's his desire, his preference. But then the Lord says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he submits to God. He submits to the Father. And he goes to the cross. He faces the false accusations and goes to the cross at the hand of corrupt government. And we should consider that in our self-examination. Because there are times that we're called to suffer for Christ. And so if our response is always and immediately like, they can't do that to me, we might have to look at that as Christians and say, I should, my first orientation should be to follow my Lord in suffering. And then if resistance is necessary, we'll get there too. That's part of the reason why it took us two and a half months to reopen the church when we closed down for COVID. Because we had, to, we had to kind of get our wits about us. Our, our, our position was to defer to the government, to have a high view of government. And, and it took a little bit of time to figure out, okay, uh, okay, we think the government's overblowing this case. We think this is an unreasonable um, requirement. And now we're going to reopen. But it took some time because we were wanting to make sure that, hey, we're willing to suffer. But what's God calling us to? And so self-examination has to be part of this. Surrender to the Lord so that you know how to resist. When it's time to resist, take a high view of government, examine yourself, and third, act consistently. Act in an intentionally consistent manner. And when I say act consistently here, I mean with your true identity. Not all these identities the world tries to foist on you, but your true identity, which is as someone who belongs to Jesus Christ. Act consistently with your Christian faith. Act in such a way that people will know that we are Christians. Our resistance may look quite different from that of an unbeliever. Remember that Jesus came and when he came, he came in a certain form. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So it's not just that the Son of God came. It's also the way He came to us. And the way He came to us was in the form of a servant. He came as a human. He came serving. He didn't come being served, but He came serving and giving Himself. The form of our life should be consistent as well. We're, we're, we're not um, uh, triumphant in this world in the sense of military might or national power. We're triumphant in Christ. And, and so we come in a form that's consistent with that reality. We come in the same form as our Lord, as He has saved us, and He was a servant to serve us and to save us. We now go in the same form as a servant. And so the form of our life should resemble what we say we believe, and this is true of everything, and it should even be true of our resistance. And so we have to think about is it loving for me to resist, or is, is love here, does love dictate that we do not resist right now? Would it serve to resist? Would it serve my fellow countrymen? Would it serve the people around me? Would it be loving to resist, or would it be not loving to resist right now? This is important because resistance can be reckless. Last week I talked about the peasant re revolt that... Um, that was at the time of Martin Luther, and how at first Luther was inclined to the peasantry. He felt like they had probably done some things that they shouldn't have done, but nevertheless, they were being uh, oppressed, that the nobles had done some things that, that were, were oppressive, and so he went to this particular city, at, and he was in great danger in going, but he, he went there to try to mediate between the nobles and the peasants. And when he sees the violence of the peasants, he, he gets back to Wittenberg, and he, and he, he writes against the peasants. And, and what he, he writes uh, was entitled, and uh, this is actually kind of humorous, uh, against the murdering, thieving hordes of peasants. The murdering, thieving hordes of peasants. It almost sounds like a, a Monty Python sketch, doesn't it? I mean, isn't that us? The, I mean, well... The hordes of peasants, not the murdering and thieving. Actually, he did not write that title. That's the actual title of his essay. But his, the title that he wrote was Against the Rioting Peasants. And the printer made it stronger and called it Against the Murdering, Thieving Hordes of Peasants. And what he, was, what he was getting at there was that it was wrong for them to revolt in this way and to be so reckless. They were killing the nobles. They were killing their families. And you may remember that Based on Luther's words, the nobles said, hey, he's right on. And so they gathered all their armies, and they slaughtered in one battle, which wasn't really a battle, between 100 and 300,000 peasants. A catastrophe, a tragic loss of life. Luther condemned the nobles for their unrestrained revenge, but he stood by his his teaching about authority, and probably rightly so. We need to be consistent. See, we can't take on a reckless form of rebellion because that can become very sinful very quickly and very chaotic and very harmful. And in the end, it's always the peasants that get slaughtered. So how can we be consistent? Well, here's a few ways that we can be consistent in our resistance. First of all, prioritize legal justifications when talking about the why and the who of disobedience to the government. So work within the system, so to say, because doing so 
shows a respect to the government. When you, when you say, wait a minute, I'm not sure that what you're requiring of us is lawful. And by the way, we're seeing a lot of this today where the federal government will come out, the administration will come out and say, we want to do this. And then as it works its way through the courts, the courts say, no, that's unconstitutional or that's illegal. And you could see that again and again. And so the wheels of justice may turn slowly, but as long as they're turning, we might be on a good track. And by working with the legality of the system as it is, we show a respect and a high view of government. And so last week I mentioned John MacArthur's church out in Orange County, California, and how they were uh, fined every week tens of thousands of dollars for simply opening their doors and meeting as a church. And the church sued the the state and the county and the church won. And they won because what the state and the county was doing in prohibiting them was illegal. They broke the law, not the church. Uh, uh, Similarly, I think it was the first Christmas during COVID, uh, Douglas Wilson's church in Moscow, Idaho, a group of them went out in the town square without masks, they're outside without masks, and sang Christmas carols. And they were broken up by the authorities and fined by the authorities. The church went to court, the civic courts. Oh, and I should mention at this point, many evangelical leaders are piling on, oh, that's wrong, they're not loving their neighbors, this is outrageous. They go to court and they win. And the reason they win is because they know the law better than the administrations that crack down on them. The government was doing what was illegal. And the courts set it right. And so God works through that. He uses the legal system. So prioritize legal justifications in addressing disobedience. And similarly, in the who we should look to the lesser magistrate. A magistrate, by the way, is is just a a civil officer. Uh, And and the idea that a lesser magistrate, meaning that the lesser magistrate is probably resisting uh, a a higher magistrate, someone who has more authority than them, but in their particular sphere, that lesser magistrate has authority and they use that authority to resist the higher authority. And the idea here, the, the reason why this is a legitimate way and and is consistent for us is because once again it's working within the system of governance the polity that we already have in in our system in the society that we live in and so we're not trying to go outside of it we're not trying to to revolt against it and break it but we're working with it and that's a very legitimate thing to do. And this is especially possible because of representative government and and Representative government tends to, it tends to have layers of accountability, and this was developed over time, obviously, and it's a blessing to us to have that kind of a thing. And so the people that put a leader into the role, that leader is representing them through elections and, and whatnot, that, that group of people in their plurality, they theoretically have authority to hold that leader accountable. And so authority ultimately rests with the group of people that choose the leader. And with those layers of chosen leaders, and sometimes some appointed leaders, depending on how it's all lined up, there is the potential of checks and balances. And so, for instance, Frederick the Wise was the elector of Saxony. He was part of the electing of the Holy Roman Emperor. And therefore, when the Holy Roman Emperor excommunicated Martin Luther in 1520, which, by the way, was not simply like, oh, you can't, you can't come and, and partake of the Lord's table here until you repent. That's excommunication pretty much in our time. It was certainly that, but it was more. It meant that when he was out and about that anyone could kill Martin Luther as an outlaw to the empire. That was the danger he was in. And so Frederick the Wise, a lesser magistrate, took Martin Luther and hid him away in one of his castles and protected him. 
and so much of the, uh, the Reformation came about because of that activity by Frederick the Wise. I've told you uh, last week and even prior about the story here in Lancaster, how when the, the health department of the state put out the regulation that churches shouldn't meet, they shouldn't meet, and if they were going to meet, they had to meet in particular ways that the state uh, affirmed social distancing and masking. But then our lesser magistrate came out and said, I won't be enforcing that law. I won't be enforcing those laws. That wasn't just disobe- that wasn't just, it wasn't just rebellion by the lesser magistrate. The lesser magistrate is saying, no, I think what you're requiring the people to do is illegal according to the freedoms afforded them by the laws of the state. And therefore, I will not be enforcing an unlawful requirement. And that gave us a place to stand and say, you know what, we're going to meet just as we always do. And the Lord blessed it, blessed his meeting, the meeting of his people. And so again, this is working within the confines of the government. Rather than throwing off the government, it's working within the confines of it to resist. Let me give you a couple more ideas here, and we're going to be wrapping up soon. There's the concept of an avenger. Here's another biblical concept. You may remember that in ancient Israel, ancient Israel designated by the Lord's command six cities of refuge. And the idea was if someone accidentally killed another person, let's say they're working together and they're swinging an axe and the axe head flies off and and strikes the other person and kills them, this person can say, oh my goodness, I, I didn't mean to do that. And they can run to the city of refuge where they would be safe from the avenger. We're not talking about a Marvel movie or a superhero. We're talking about an angry family member who wants to kill this person who did that. And of course, if no one's there to to see what happened or to witness this or, or, or that person wasn't there, you know, who's to say what's true? And therefore, they had the city of refuge where they could provide due process. And so there could be a lawful Uh, and and do process of justice that would help determine what justice should look like. But you see that whole idea, it's, it's it's built into the system of justice so that the, uh, the, the interested parties could make their way and find justice through that system. And according to John Calvin, Those who do not use their power, if they have power within a society, those who who do not use their power to guard the welfare of the people are traitors. And so those that go along with unlawful laws, unlawful enforcement, to to the detriment of the people, they're traitors to those laws, to the contract of society. And If you have power within the legal system to bring about justice, you shouldn't withhold it. You should use it. In our society, there are many layers and levels of power made possible not only through the system of governance and the lesser magistrate, but even on the private side of the ledger, things like capital in capitalism. Let me give you an example. Uh, The only social media I really connect with is Twitter. And it's not because I want to tweet anything. And I'm not really following sort of friends. That's not the idea for me. It's just a stream of news that breaks first. And so I can, I can tune in to certain areas of news that I'm most interested in on Twitter. And it's a huge mess. Uh, it, you know, sorting through that, there are just times I'm just too exhausted to even try. But nevertheless, the voices are continually going. And there are times I want to tune in and find out what's going on. And one of the big things over the last several years is that conservative voices have been muted on Twitter. And there's many ways they're doing that. And so uh, in seeing the, the, the level of silliness that got to, what happened? Elon Musk, who's a 
champion of free speech. I'm not saying he's a champion in general. Uh, but he believes in free speech. He's looking at Twitter. He's saying, that's the town square of our day. And free speech needs to be there. Not censored speech, free speech. And so what did he do? He went out and he bought Twitter. Must be nice to be able to buy Twitter. But he, you see, he had the power to do it. And he swept in and he did it. And you know what he did next? He fired everyone who was responsible for censorship on the platform. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm commending this as a means by which people are sort of saved and served, the freedoms preserved in our country. But I'm not commending Elon. I, like I said, he, he, I mean, Elon is, is pro-abortion, highly problematic. We're, we're not aligned with Elon. Elon believes the human race has to become interplanetary. Uh, failing to recognize the incredible gift that planet Earth is to the human race. I'm not saying he wouldn't say that it is, but the idea that he doesn't believe in the covenant of God to keep this earth going until the Lord decides to call it a day. And so I'm not promoting Elon as much as I'm saying this is how it can work. If someone has power, small or great, to bring about justice in our society, they ought to to do so. And again, that's within the legal system, and it's a right and good way for Christians to resist. In all of this, utilize prudence. Look down the road and consider if your solution that you're proposing is actually better than the current situation. Take time to think that through. You know, here in the West, uh, several years ago, Muammar Gaddafi was overrun in Libya, and he had long been known as a terrible dictator, and I believe that he was a murderous dictator. And people here celebrated when he was thrown down and executed. He was actually tortured and executed. And it seemed like, oh, the, the people rose up and they, they're getting their freedom. You know what it was? It was the Arab Spring. That's not better. That's the Muslim Brotherhood. And because I had a little interaction with Egypt, I learned how, how quickly, how brutally the Muslim Brotherhood treated the people of Egypt when they took over in that country to the point where the Egyptians, who had some taste of democracy, rose up and threw out the Muslim Brotherhood. And churches were involved in that as well. And so utilize prudence. Don't be too quick to celebrate the overthrowing of government. Again, have that, having that high view. But think and consider, what am I actually proposing? What would be the outcome if I had my desired way? Also, employ resistance. Last one here. Employ resistance as opposed to outright rebellion. And so you've often heard the phrase civil disobedience. So it's happening within the civil realm. And it's civil in its way, right? It's not violent. And what it is, it's disobedience. And so you've seen people like uh, sitting in places where they shouldn't sit. Um, uh, some people are gluing themselves to the street in different parts of the world uh, to resist. I, I don't recommend that. But here's, a, you know, here's something is, is what about being in a, in, a, in a place where they were requiring a mask and saying, you know what, I'm not going to wear this mask because I want my countrymen to understand that we're made in the image of God and we're supposed to see each other's face. And for all of us to wear a mask all the time is really, it, it, it's detrimental to human dignity. And so I'm, I'm going to take my mask off for the good of my countrymen, but if I get asked to put it on, I'll put it back on. That's a bit of, it's just a slight bit of resistance, isn't it? And then maybe another step, maybe not wearing a mask, and then when they ask you to put it on, you don't put it on. Then you bear the consequence of that disobedience. These are mild forms of disobedience. By the way, just for full disclosure, when I go into a medical office building, 
I wear a mask. They're still requiring it. From my understanding, there may be other, maybe, maybe uh, the mask doesn't stop or help with COVID at all. That seems to be pretty uh, demonstrable right now. But it does help with other things and people that, anyway, I'm not going to go into that. But um, out of respect for that environment and the immunocompromised, I wear the mask. But prior to this time when you were having to wear the mask at Home Depot and every restaurant before you were taking a bite or, or even some restaurants requiring you wear the mask between bites, um, that might have been a good, a good way to go. And I just give it as an example to say it's, it's not violent, but it's saying I, I'm not going to do this. It's, it's not good for us. It's not loving, and I'm going to resist. And so maybe there's a time for that. And again, before we get so high on resistance, remember Jesus, his intentionality, his restraint through his ordeal. Remember what his suffering brought us. And so it's not as simple as simply to say, yeah, let's resist. Remember that the rebel spirit is energizing. It, there's, it, it can feel good to rebel. Right? Have you ever rebelled against your parents? feels very freeing, feels very energizing, right? People want to cast off restraint. And so just, just having that rebel impulse, that's, that's not glorifying to Christ. And so think about our Lord who had every right to rebel against the earthly authorities, but did not. So we affirm, obviously, there's a time to rebel. There's a time to resist. But it shouldn't be so quick for Christians. Surrender to the Lord so that you know how to resist. I've been using that phrase. I want to ask John to come. We're just going to sing a song in closing here in a moment. I've been using that phrase, surrender to the Lord so that you know how to resist. It's because He's our highest authority. And we're obliged, we're obligated to bow to Him and submit to Him first and foremost. And so surrender to Him. And just before we sing, I, I, I want to call any here who may not yet have surrendered to the Lord. You haven't yet placed your trust in Him. Today's a good day. You can't get the rest of life right if you're rebellious to the ultimate authority. The only way you can get these things in order it's if you surrender to him first. Would you stand with us, please? And let's sing his truth, his grace.